Good morning, welcome. You're in the How to Become a Distributed Company, a step-by-step -step guide session. It is Thursday at about 11 o'clock or so. Hi. Hello. Uh, I am going to go through a little bit about who I am, a little bit about 10.7 and what we do, and then I'm kind of going to tell you a story of how we actually started as a brick and mortar company and then evolved into being a completely distributed company and how, how I was originally totally against that for about 10 years. Um, and it's more of a step-by-step uh, -step guide that I've created based on hindsight. And so, like, that's just something to keep in mind. And then at the end we'll have some advice and maybe some things that are not great about being distributed. And if you have any questions, you don't have to wait until the end if you really would like to start a conversation during the, during the talk, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, I am Ivan Stegic. Um, I am an immigrant from South Africa. I, my parents are from Croatia, so I have Eastern European ancestry. I started 10.7 in 2007, and I immigrated to the United States in 1999. I am a trained research physicist. I was at Honeywell before I started 10.7, uh, and I was also at Emation, and I was part of an amazing team that made the first US manufactured optical media. We made CDRW, DVD, HD DVD, Blu-ray, uh, Blu and it was all done in Oakdale, Minnesota, and in Wapaton, North Dakota. Um, so I was very happy to be part of that team. I also have a degree in psychology, so uh, my current role of being responsible for the well-being of the humans in my company and also the kind of the general happiness of clients, it's kind of awesome. It brings me real joy because I get to spend time doing left brain and right brain stuff. Um, 10.7, we create and care for Drupal powered websites. We've been around since 2007. As I mentioned earlier, I started the company in my basement. I was there for about two years. Um, I was at a startup before I started 10.7, directly before, and I had worked about 60 hours a week and had a one-year-old and a two-year-old, and that was not sustainable at all. And so, kind of started 10.7 by mistake. Um, but we've certainly evolved. We hired a contractor um, in 2009, very quickly realized that um, having a contractor in your basement um, all the time doesn't really work very well, so we moved out and into a shared office space uh, with another agency. Uh, there are eight full-time employees now at 10.7. Um, we offer full health dental vision insurance. We offer 401k. We have a tech stipend now that we've had since the beginning of becoming distributed. So every full-time employee gets $1,500 a year to spend on their technology or their home office, honestly. Uh, we also offer a professional development stipend so employees can learn and train and go to conferences or buy Drupalize Me or do whatever they need to do to get better. Um, this year we started offering, offering is the wrong word, um, we started uh, contributing to renewable energy certificates and water restoration certificates so that we can say that we are offsetting the energy that every employee uses at 10.7 with something that's renewable. So technically our sites are green if you are able to extrapolate that um, in some way. So that's 10.7. Um, we value honesty. We speak the truth even when it's bad news. We don't keep things to ourselves. We promise things that we know we can deliver on and we will tell you bad news um, because that's part of being honest. We, are, we value mindfulness. Uh, we are aware of our actions and how they affect our clients and our community. We are mindful of our clients' need for quality and for timely results and we also recognize that everybody has something to contribute. We value sharing, so we're altruists at heart. We share our expertise, processes, and experiences so that we can benefit the community, and we do so without expectation at all. Um, 
and everything we create at 10.7 is open source by default and we will only make it proprietary or belonging to our clients so that it's secret if they absolutely require us to for some reason. And we also value speaking plainly. We build trust by being patient translators and by putting ourselves in our clients' shoes. We help you understand what you want and what you need. And we work really hard to hire people with empathy because we know that jargon is very difficult and shouldn't have a place in the kind of work we do. The caveat for this talk is your mileage may vary. Um, as I said or alluded to earlier, we didn't plan this transition. transition. Um, so this session is more of a retrospective than anything else. Um, it's kind of a story of the evolution of what happened over the course of about a year. Um, and we'll definitely cover some of the cons of being a distributed company. And we'll try to come up with some advice as well. Um, and I, I added this slide this morning because I felt like I should really call this talk how we became a distributed company, a retrospective, as opposed to how to become one. Um, so maybe the next time I give this talk, the slide won't be here, but it will be right at the beginning. All right, step one, a culture that supports trust. Um, so I think one of the main ingredients of going from a kind of co-located office to a fully distributed company um, is trust. You have to have trust with your coworkers and your teammates and as the business owner or the manager you have to trust that things are going to happen. Um, we were lucky enough to run into a bad horrible, not so good client a few years ago and um, that client revealed us to ourselves, I would say. Um, we did a great deal of hard work around the client to establish our own core values, which are the ones that I went through earlier. Um, we did a ton of introspection, figured out what our mission was um, and what our why statement is and I think that having done that allowed us to be more flexible and successful at actually becoming a distributed company. Um, and it's not something that stops. It's something that you have to continue to work on as a team. Um, so once you achieve it, it's like, um, keep going, right? Yes? Can you share a couple more sentences about what made it a particularly bad client? I mean, it sounds like it impacted your company a lot. It, I will. I, I have some slides. So yes, I will. I will absolutely get to that. Can you give us names? I cannot give you names. I cannot give you names. You don't know them though. Okay. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what do I mean by a culture that supports trust, and how do you know if you have one? Um, so. I want to spend a little bit of time and tell you where we were and then go through like what happened and how, how we started this journey to become distributed. So in 2011, um, we bought some property in downtown Minneapolis and it was, um, it was the next step in the evolution of the company. We had shared an office space with an agency that was going out of business. And we were like, okay, we need to find a lease because you guys are going to break yours and we can't afford to have this whole thing. Um, so we started looking and there just so happened to be a building in the north loop of downtown that was a, uh, an association, a commercial and a residential association building. So it was a condo. So we bought it and we thought, and by we I mean my wife and I bought the condo and our accountant and our attorney said you should own that separate than the business because um, that's just smart to do. And we said, okay. So we bought that and 10.7 occupied it and always occupied it. And it was purpose built for um, the work that we did. And the idea was have a single room, have a giant table, um, 12 desks, all of us working at the same table. We're all connected to each other physically as well as by the work that we're doing. We're all learning and building something together. 
And in 2011, our developers were mostly junior. And so what you heard from the keynote was invest in those junior developers, like bring those people on. We very much did that um, very early on. And so being together really, I thought, helped us learn from each other. Um, so collaboration was really key. And in my opinion, you could do that only really by actually being together in a physical space. We had slippers. So you come in and take your shoes off and put your slippers on and come to the office. We had a breakfast bar, encourage people to kind of not worry about breakfast in the morning, just get it at the office. Um, we tried to make it as fun as possible to be there. Um, like eight years ago, that seemed like a good thing to do. I don't know if I'd approach it the same way um, now. But the biggest issue we had was fighting distraction and being able to focus. So it is an open plan office. It was an open plan office. Um, eventually that became something that we just couldn't really deal with um, very well. So collaboration kind of went away um, as, we get, as we got older. Um, so I kind of hoped that the office would be a constant point of reference, something that we could rally around, but the honest truth is that things change. People change in the team. Um, work gets more complex. Uh, when you have more complex work, you end up spending more time on it. Budgets get larger. Um, the tools you use start evolving. Uh, they generally get better. Sometimes you outgrow the tools that you've used, so we stopped using Basecamp and started using Jira. Some tools stick around. The general rule is things changed over five years. And if we fast forward to 2016, we had this one bad client um, that we had an awful experience with. Um, and um, I gave a talk about this at TC Drupal in 2016. And there's a link there that you can follow and you can look through that, um, that talk if you're interested in. Um, the, the, the reason I say we had a bad client was we felt like we were being um, used and abused. And the client we had was toxic and made our team feel um, like they did not ever want to work on anything related to 10.7 even. And it was... Um, it was the result of trying to get rid of this client that I reached out to an organizational development company that deals with human, re uh, human resources, but also with conflict resolution and organizational development. And they were able to help us um, figure out exactly how to get rid of the client. Um, and in the process of doing that, how to better communicate amongst ourselves we ended up um, doing the disk analysis, which is um, really inform uh, informational and really um, guiding to how uh, people on your own team uh, relate to each other. And it allows you, once you've mapped every person on your team on this disk, to know, and yourself, to know how people relate to you and to help you relate to those other people uh, that are on the disk. Um, it also helped us understand how we like to work, uh, not just on our own, but with our teammates and our clients. Um, and most importantly, it supported this sense of trust that we um, realized we had amongst us. And. I think that um, the first thing you need to have when you go and decide that you're going to be a distributed team is this element of trust. It's not, um, it's not like this. It's, um, I think if you have a culture of distrust and micromanagement, a culture of butts in seats um, where managers and leaders are freaking out if people aren't in the office, um, I think that's counterproductive. I think that the people that you work with on a daily basis are adults and you should be able to uh, trust them that they're going to do their work. And Cube land, for the sake of Cube land 
is just that. It's for managers and owners to feel like there's productivity and being able to look out and see, oh, the people are here. That means that stuff's getting done. Ah, that's BS. That's, that's not the truth. And um, I, like, once I was able to um, figure out that if I trust people, they will trust me back, and that we're all adults, like, that was a, that was a good moment. Um, it really doesn't matter where you are to get work done. And that's, um, that's the important thing. So the first inkling that I had that things might be changing after being so gung-ho that we're all going to be in this office in downtown Minneapolis was at DrupalCon in New Orleans. Um, I attended the business summit that year and talked to a bunch of awesome people from Lullabot and Four Kitchens and they had all, I mean lullabot has been distributed forever, Four Kitchens was right in the middle of their uh, conversion to being distributed, maybe right at the end of that. Um, and then I went to a talk that was entitled Live the Dream, Work Remote, Building a Successful Distributed Drupal Shop. And I was really inspired by that week in New Orleans, so I had a ton of ideas going around in my head. Um, and when I got back over the weekend, I kind of spent a bunch of time processing and thinking about, well, maybe this is something we should actually try. And I know I've been against it, but ah, people change. Um, and I felt, I felt um, confident enough with my team and vulnerable, and, and vulnerable enough that I could actually share this with the team. Um, so I did that on um, Monday morning. And I, and I kind of floated the idea and there was um, a fair amount of silence because I don't think people actually believed what they'd been hearing, what I'd said. Um, and and I, I think things evolved. The, the very first thing we needed to do, which is the next step, is define why we were doing this. Um, and the, the truth is we didn't really have a single reason. Um, snow commutes in Minneapolis are a time suck. They really are awful. Um, substitute BART in, in the Bay Area, substitute any other like hour-long commute in and out of work. Um, parking is also a problem. Downtown Minneapolis just happens to be exploding in terms of development, so that really there are no parking ramps, no street, like it's crazy. Um, another reason was DrupalCon really excited me, so timing was just right. Um, it also felt like our next step, um, which is kind of a squishy thing, but it just felt like the next evolution of 10.7. Um, and also others were doing it, which is never a really a good reason for anything. But it's just, it's another data point. Like, well, okay, that, okay, so everyone else is doing it, so maybe, maybe I should consider it as well. Um, and the thing we thought coming out of that staff meeting was, you know what, let's try it. I mean, we have the luxury of owning the space. We're not going to break a lease if we decide that we're all going to go distributed. Um, let's try being distributed and going remote. And so, I think I skipped a slide. Yeah. So the next step was for me to realize that I was the one that was leading this and that I needed to support my team in this transition and that we needed to have some very clear expectations of what was going, um, of what was going to happen. Um, the thing that I wished we had done at this point was I wished we had put some sort of a deadline on this experiment, on this idea that we're going to distribute. Like, we're going to try this for three months. We never did that. Um, and I'll get to that a little later, but if we had done that, that would have been a little bit more of a finite experiment, and I think I could have thought of it in a little bit more of a um, contained way, but we didn't really have a deadline. I was okay with that at the time, um, but in retrospect, maybe that wasn't the best of things. So, how to support your team. Um, make sure you have a dedicated workspace at home. 
um, and be sensitive to that because some people live in small apartments and so maybe there's not available space. Um, do everything you can as a leader to um, make sure that a workspace at home is available. Make sure that there's a great chair. It's a stupid thing, but uh, chairs are important. Or a standing desk. Pay for a standing desk. Like, you have to have good equipment at home. You kind of take it for granted if it's all at the office, right? Um, make sure you support your team in having high-speed internet. Encourage them to bump up if they're able to. That's why we implemented the tech stipends, so that you could use that to pay for a higher level of internet if you, if you needed to. Um, make sure you're using real-time chat, like Slack, and video. Video is so important, and um, pay for it, especially if it's um, you know, critical to your business needs. You want to be able to see people, um, and crappy video and low bandwidth is like, we don't live in the early 2000s. Like, we have high speed now and great software. Pay for it. It's important to reduce that friction. And then um, have clear expectations of the team. Um, keep each other informed. Like, what are you doing today? What do you have a stand up? If you don't have a stand up, you should have a stand up. Um, make sure you use that group chat and use video. Realize that everybody is an adult. Let people make decisions for themselves, and by extension, let them make mistakes as well and learn from those. And live your values. Make decisions based on the values that you have as a company. And the next step is to iterate. So, the way we started was we experimented with everybody working from home on Friday. And we decided Friday because um, not really terribly productive at the end of a Friday at the office anyway. And so we felt like we wouldn't lose anything by doing the whole of Friday. Um, and so we didn't, like, it wasn't a hard decision to stay at home on Fridays and do that. Um, and once we had done that for a few weeks, we decided, oh, this is working pretty well. Let's add another day. So we added Wednesdays. And so we were in the office Monday, Tuesday, then we were at home on Wednesdays, back in the office on Thursdays, and then um, remote again on Fridays. Um, that just felt wrong. It just kind of didn't work. Um, and so we switched the two days to Tuesdays and Thursdays. We still kept it at two days. We didn't want to go back to one day. Um, and we thought that it would be bad if we went linearly. So instead of going from Wednesdays and Fridays to like Mondays and Tuesdays or Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we felt like for us as a team, it would be better to go one day on, one day off. And so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're in the office, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, we're at home. Um, and this went on for months, literally happened just, we just kept doing this for four months, and I thought, oh yeah, victory, right? This is awesome, um, because I'm in a groove, this is working out for me, um, did I skip a slide? I think I did. I was comfortable, I didn't have a deadline, it was working out for me. Um, Yeah, but things change. Um, so we were coasting hybrid for months. Um, someone on the, the on the team thought that maybe it wasn't working out as well as he would hope. In fact, he thought it might work even better. Um, so he requested, I would like to be full-time remote. Um, and I'm like, what? But this is working out so well. Um, and he came up with some good reasons. Um, he was like, well, it's been working great so far. Uh, we have Slack done. We have video done. Our offices at home are all working well. We have great chairs. Like, there's really um, 
Like, I actually have improved productivity. I'm not spending time an hour and a half to two hours coming into the office, sitting up, finding parking. Like, I um, am not distracted anymore. I can mute Slack. I couldn't mute people in the office. Um, and again, commutes in the snow suck. So basically, I couldn't say no. I mean, he was right. Like, everything that we were doing was conducive to being fully remote um, all of the time. Um, so eventually, you have to make a decision. Um, and it's OK to experiment. Have a time frame on that, though. Take your time. But at some point, someone has to make that decision. And so we realized a few things. Um, there was no reason to be bound to the office physically, and I think the fact that we were at home on and off you know, made us realize that. We hadn't had a client in the office for two years. We literally went through the calendar and looked for meeting invites and couldn't find one. There was one in 2014 that we had that we... So we're like, okay, clients are not really coming to us, so we can always go to the client if we need to. Like, that's not a reason to stay. We own the office, like that's like there are no lease considerations. We turned around and became remote and I started looking for a tenant. Like that's we didn't have to break a three year lease or a five year lease and be on the hook for, you know, forty thousand dollars. And so once we decided we were going to be totally remote, we had to kind of decide what kind of remote, what kind of distributed company. And there are basically three categories. So there's co-located, that's everybody in the same place all the time. Um, you're physically present, you have a lease. There's co-located, but remote first. So you're basically a hybrid company. So you have offices, but you um, are flexible on being remote. And a great example of this is GitHub. Uh, GitHub has a main office in San Francisco. I mean, they have, I think, over six or 700 employees now. Everyone goes to San Francisco to onboard um, when you're hired, but you're always given the option of being remote first. So they're a good example of a remote first company. I believe that um, I was at a conference where I talked to someone from GitHub and uh, she said that there are still people who are always in the office and they're mostly the accountants in the Bay Area at GitHub. So like, she said she doesn't think that they'll be able to convince them to become fully remote. That's just the way it is. And then, um, of course, being completely distributed where everyone is remote. So someone has to make the call. So I made that call. We were truly hybrid, right? We could have continued to be hybrid. We didn't really have a policy on new hires, so we could have had those new hires start to do what we did, right? 40% remote, 60% in the office. Um, but I decided that being hybrid wasn't what we wanted to do, so we went totally distributed, and that was the um, Polaroid we took of the last day in the office. Um, I think we're all moderately happy. Uh, so here are the steps quickly. So a culture that supports trust. Remember, this is for going from co-located to distributed. Defining why you're doing it. Supporting your team and setting expectations as a leader. Iterate, so experimenting and figuring out what's best for your team whether it's one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, whatever that cadence might be. Don't get comfortable like I did. Set a deadline so that you can actually evaluate where you're at and either pull the plug and go back or jump full into being completely distributed and then actually make that decision. So there are challenges with being distributed. You do need a workspace at home one that's dedicated to just work, that does help. We all struggle with isolation. Mental health is a very important thing, so being able to see your colleagues on video chat is important, but being able to go out to a coffee shop or a um, library or to go out somewhere where you're around other people, that's an important thing. 
Um, I've mentioned this already. Uh, being able to prioritize work, that's um, a challenge as well sometimes. So you have to have good uh, systems in place to be able to know what things are important um, and how to prioritize them. And we have, I mean, systems like Jira that help us do that and stand-ups that we have on a daily basis. Uh, benefits and taxes are a challenge as well because sometimes you have employees that live in Austin or Portland and the Twin Cities and there are different rules and benefits and coverages. So that's a challenge, but there are uh, ways to get around that and services you can use like Gusto to help you with that. Um, and then making sure that you have a work-life -life focus that isn't completely skewed in one direction or another. One of the risks of being at home is that sitting at your desk is really easy and so just continuing to do that and forgetting that you actually have the rest of the house and a life to spend. Um, so making sure that you can do things actively to focus on that um, balance is important. Um, some advice. Uh, invest in the right tools. Make sure you have high quality tools for video, for chat, for file sharing, for issue tracking, a great calendar system. We have a, an attendance channel in, the, in Slack and we basically we use that as a punch in, punch out, um, kind of like, I'm here, I'm available, or I'm away from my desk, or I'm out. Um, we, we kind of distilled every single possible state into five, and we have five icons and five words that we use. We use here, meaning I'm, I'm here working and available. We use away, meaning I'm at lunch, or taking a break, or having coffee, or walking the dog. We use out, meaning I am not at work and not available. There's a red triangle. I like not here. Uh, we have meeting to indicate that you're in a meeting, and we have focus, which basically says I'm trying to work on something here. I'm probably muted Slack or notifications, so if you don't hear from me, that's why. Um, and then we use the 30-minute rule. If you are banging your head against a problem for more than 30 minutes, you should stop and ask for help because you're probably not going to figure out if you've been spending that much time. And it's a good reason to actually talk to someone and video with someone. Try to go to video as soon as possible. Um, I don't know if you've had long discussions in Slack in a public channel with many people trying to figure something out and it just being completely confusing. When you start noticing that kind of behavior, please stop and like say, we should video about this. Let's get on a call and figure it out because it's obviously too complicated. So um, we try to go to video as soon as we notice something like that's happening. Um, work in your workspace. Try not to work where you're you know, spending time with your family. Like keep those things separate. And then absolutely keep hours. It doesn't matter what those hours are. Just make sure everybody on your team knows what they are. Some people like to you know, go for a run in the middle of the day or do yoga and keep later hours, break their days up into two pieces. That, that's totally fine. Um, and then change your scenery, take breaks, walk your dog um, or your cat. I've seen people walking cats around my neighborhood, so that's a thing. Um, and I think that's the last bullet I have, so thanks for listening. Any questions? Thoughts? I'm just wondering if you've done like any recruit, like get everyone together, sort of retreat base since you've made the change, or plan to? So, um, all of my employees are still in the Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, and Hastings, and um, so we haven't done an official company retreat, but we do something called an in-person. So every quarter, it's about every, it's when we have when we haven't seen each other for a couple months we have an in-person. And so we actually had one on Friday. And at an in-person, we, um, we basically spend from nine to five in, um, in a library, like because libraries are free, or um, in a conference room at our local co-op. Um, and we will like do a retrospective on a project, for example. Because those things are usually nicer to do in-person than they are 
on a video chat, for example. Um, so we haven't had retreats yet because we haven't got employees that are, we have contractors out of town but not employees yet. Um, but we'll have to do those at some point next year, I would guess, the year after. Do you have anybody that was resistant to uh, go for a Besides me? <laughs> um, yes, we had one person who had the longest commute of everyone who, who was um, not very keen on the idea. Uh, but then when, she, uh, when we started, she, she very much um, started to realize that you know, she actually gained almost two hours of her life by not having to commute. So she changed her mind very quickly, which was great. Dan? Oh, uh, so given that you've been set up this way for the past two years now? Yeah, two and a half years. I'm surprised that, that you you haven't hired someone from out of the region, and why do you think that's just, just the way it worked out? Or, I mean, when you put out a job, you know, you probably get people from all over the country, right? So we, so we do have uh, three contractors, one in Portland, one in um, Austin, and up until recently, one in Michigan. I, um, they're technically team members. We technically did hire them after we went distributed. Mm -hmm. They're just not full-time employees. So like they spent, they're technically 1099s. Mm -hmm. um, we did publish a post or a job post a year and a half ago looking for a full-time employee. And I was amazed at how much of a response we had compared to what we used to have back when we would just, you know, be in the Minneapolis, right. St. Paul region. Um, but we decided not to hire because um, we've discovered that when we look, when we had an in-person after we posted that job post, uh, we looked at the table and at all of the people that were around the table and discovered that every single one of us, except for me, was originally a part-time contractor, then a full-time contractor, then an employee, and we decided that it just wasn't the way we hired people. Like we don't, we haven't hired anyone just as a full-time employee. So the people that are contractors are we're kind of grooming them. I guess is, is that your that's kind of official policy now, or is I don't know if it's an official policy. Like if we got a project now and had to scale up very quickly, I would consider hiring full-time employee, but I mean, I think we'd be, we've had more success going through the phases of dating and getting engaged and getting married, so to speak, right? right. So when it comes to like, some of those contractors who are new, um, started working with after going to this fully remote thing, how did you work on that step of building trust with them? It's a great question. Um, one of the things we did was we created an employee handbook and that's online and open source, so anyone can actually use it. Um, so we have to have, we have to come up with some sort of an onboarding process. Um, and one of the things that are part of the onboarding process is buddying up the person who's new with someone else on the team, so that they have a significant person that they can talk to about any issues or problems that they might have. Um, I still do one-on-ones with all of the team members, whether they're contractors or employees, on a monthly basis. And so that kind of factors into new people as well, because I get, I get an opportunity to do um, kind of a check-in on a monthly basis. And then we also use knowyourteam.com, which is um, a really wonderful tool that um, sends out questions on a bi-weekly, no, every, it's two or three times a week. And there's a social question, and then there's a company question, and people respond to it. And um, it also has this icebreaker functionality. So when someone new starts, uh, they get asked a couple of questions. And they answer those questions. And then once they've answered them, those answers go to the whole team. And she, received, she or he receives um, an email with everybody else's original icebreaker questions. So that's another way that we try to onboard people. Anybody else? No? Awesome. Thanks for coming. We're I think we're right on time. Thanks a lot.